take your Bibles this morning, turn to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 21, when Jesus comes to church. Have you all seen Jesus come to church? Amen. All right, take your Bibles, let's stand together. Matthew 21, we'll begin reading with verse 12. Matthew presents Jesus as king, and we're going to talk about his kingdom work today. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were so displeased. And said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have you never read, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. Lord, we believe that your Holy Spirit is always in attendance to the reading of the Word of God. And I pray for your Holy Spirit now to anoint me afresh and anew, that you would cleanse me from all unrighteousness and put a right spirit within me and take not the Holy Spirit from me. God, thank you for the Holy Spirit. I pray that he would anoint every hearer today, that we will hear what the Spirit says. And you said in your Word, that he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. God, speak to our hearts is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As I said, the Gospel of Matthew presents Jesus as King. Jesus has every right to come into any church and cleanse it because He is authoritative. He's the authoritative King as we see here. This is His house. It's not my house. It's not your house. It's His house. He said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. We're going to study that today. Uh, there's a clear word. I love this verse in Ephesians 5.15. See then that ye walk circumspectly, that is carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now that's a good word today because we're living in a day where things are as confusing as ever. I mean, there's there's this need all of a sudden for tolerance, and, and uh, there's, there's no black and white issues. Everything is gray, and it's a confusing time to live in. But the Bible says, see that you walk carefully, circumspectly, not as fools, redeeming the time. That is, that we're to make the most of the time. Why? Because the days are evil. Has it occurred to you the things that used to make us blush, make us blush no longer? Has it occurred to you the things that the church used to cry out against? The church is uh, unusually silent about today. What's happened? Has the, lo has the light been put under a bushel? Has the salt lost its savor? Paul says, listen, you better make the most of the time because the days are evil. I want to ask you a question. How can you make the most of your time? Have you ever wondered with all the evil and the wickedness in our day and time, if you could really make a difference? Have you ever felt like the psalmist who said, if the foundations were destroyed, what would the righteous do? Well, I want to submit to you that I believe with all my heart that just one man, one woman, one child, one young person could make an eternal difference in the lives of other people. If we would just do a few things, I want to give them to you right now. All right, number one is purity. Jesus went in two, he says. Did you see that in verse? That's important that I, I bring your attention to that. Verse 12. And Jesus went in two. When Jesus comes into a person's life, there's a radical transformation of purity called holiness. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. And what did he say? Behold, all things become new. We are created new in Jesus Christ. We must get to the place that we understand that we have a holy God living inside of us. The question many ask today is, how close can I get to the world and still live for God? The question ought to be, is how far away can I get? The Bible says, be ye separate from the world. We're not to look, act, or 
do as the world. I'll tell you the problem I see in the church, and I've been uh, in the church all my life. The church is beginning to look more like the world than ever before. I mean, you really look at it. I mean, the world has come into the church like never before. And somehow it's entered the mind of people in the church. Well, if we're going to reach the world, we need to look like the world. No, no, that's not going to reach the world. The way we're going to reach the world is show them the opposite. They're seeing hate. We need to show love. They, 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 they see unforgiveness. We need to show forgiveness. Uh, they, they see confusion. We, we, need to see, we need to show people peace and unity. The Bible says, be ye separate from the world. You notice Jesus is cleansing the temple. Would you please understand that there are two temples he wants to cleanse? Number one, there is a personal temple. I call it a personal transformation. A personal temple. That's you. Listen to 1 Corinthians 9, 16. It makes it very clear. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you? Now, let that sink in a moment. Do you take care of this temple that God's given you? Hello? You know, the Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now listen to what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians 3.17 If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. We want to see God work in our lives. But it always begins with purity. You say, well, Pastor Ronnie, that's impossible. There's no way we can be pure. Not within ourselves, but by the precious bread, ruby royal blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are made right with the Holy God. Thank God for the blood. And listen to me, church. The blood has not lost its power. And, and if we cannot be separate from the world, if we cannot be pure, what is that saying? But that the blood has lost its power. What is that saying? But God's word is wrong. We're compromising today to get along with people. We want to be able to make everybody happy. But I'll tell you, if you live different than the world lives, you're going to make somebody unhappy. Right. You are. I mean, there's going to be somebody that's not going to like it. Uh, you, you know why? Can I say it just like it T.I. is? It makes them look bad. It makes them feel bad. Well, you don't cuss like I do. You don't listen to my dirty jokes. You don't act like I do. But isn't that the way we're supposed to be? We're supposed to stand out. There's a personal transformation. I love this verse, Isaiah 59.1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither is ear heavy that he cannot hear, but your sins have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. There must be purity before there can be any power. We want to see God work, don't we? But there has to be purity. There has to be a pure motivation in our life. Why are you here today? Are you here to give God the worship he's worthy of? Your motive must be, I want to praise you. I want to thank you. My heart has been transformed by the power of God. And I just want to come and say, Lord, you are so good. Amen. God is good. Amen. And look what he's done in you. He's done a good work. And he didn't do this work for it to fizzle out. He wants it to get stronger and stronger and stronger in you. I want to ask you something. Do you have a pure heart today? We come to church and wonder why we don't get anything out of it. Is it because we find it most difficult because maybe our hearts are not pure? Our motives are not pure? Has a personal transformation taken place in your heart? If it has, you can't hide it. It's going to show. It's going to bless others. It's going to affect others. You know, joy is contagious. Amen. Love is contagious. I'll tell you, you start walking in peace, joy, and love, oh, it'll make Satan his crowd mad. But you know what? The joy of the Lord is our strength. The personal transformation of what God's done in you. I, 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 I used to think, well, one day when I get to heaven now, I'll, I'll see God. But you know, I was studying one of the Beatitudes one day, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 8. And this is something that really spoke to my heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You know what that really means? You can see God right now. You can see him working in your life, your personal life, in the life of your family, in the life of your church, because God is real to you. He may not be real to other people, but he's real to you. Don't let nobody rob you of that joy or that peace. 
Because you see, it will affect those around you. You see what happens, people are going to see God working through you, and they're going to say, I want what you want. How are we going to transform our communities if we're not transformed? Judgment must first begin in the house of God, and that's the second temple He wants to cleanse. He is what I call a people transformation, a peculiar temple, God's church. Notice what He says. There's some doubt here. He said in verse 12, he said, And Jesus went into the temple, and then He cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple. The second temple He wants to cleanse is His church. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. God has always wanted a people unto Himself. Do you understand that? Do you, do you know how important that is? God called the nation of Israel out, not because they were big in numbers. He wanted a people to Himself. God is a jealous God. Are y'all following me? He wants you and I to be shut up to Him. We are to come into this house of worship for one reason, and one reason only, to seek God, to praise God, to worship God, and we shouldn't let nothing else interfere with that. Folks, people need transformation. People need the Lord, and the church, we must show them transformation, that God has changed us. I'll tell you something, you don't have to, as a, you don't have to advertise a fire to get a crowd. You, 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 you get fired up for the Lord Jesus Christ, and people have just come out of curiosity. I was in my first church. I was 19, and uh, a fire got started in that church. Not a literal one, but a spiritual fire. And we went from like 40 people, 50 people, to over 300 overnight. I mean, the church just began to blossom. You know why? Because those people had one thing in mind, and that was to seek God. When people come together to seek God, and they're all together, there's unity. People are serving God. They've got one focus. They've got one vision, and that is that they themselves will experience God and that they will go out and share that experience with others. You will see God working in your kids. You'll see God working in your nation. What did he say? If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. Amen. We need a healing today of our land. It starts not with the White House, but with God's house. Yeah, if my people, he didn't say if Trump, <laughs> he didn't say at the White House, he didn't say the schoolhouse. No. He said, if my people, we are God's people. We've been transformed by the power of God, and the world's waiting to see. The world, I, did y'all hear me? The world's waiting to see this God who hears your prayer, who forgives your sin, who heals your land. Our land needs healing. And so the third thing, this is good now, we're going to go deep. Powerful transformation. And he overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Jesus made a powerful statement that day when He cleansed the temple. It must have been quite shocking for the Jewish leaders who pride themselves in their religious culture and, and their practices at the temple to have Jesus come in and turn everything upside down. You know Jesus can do that. Who does He think He is? I mean, that's what they were asking. Who is this Jesus? Does He think... He's in charge of this place? Yes, a matter of fact, He is. Jesus has every right to transform His house. It's His house. He said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And when it becomes anything else, it's not His house. That's the second thing I want to go to. Because when a church gets pure, oh, can you start seeing God do some mighty things? Because then you can learn how to pray. Let's learn how to pray. Because you see, this is what happened. It says, when Jesus came in, I love that, when Jesus went into the temple, the house of God, He cast out those who sold and bought in the temple, overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves, 
And Jesus said this. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. You want to see your prayers answered? Listen to me carefully. We often, I hear people say, well, preacher, I just don't see God hearing my prayers. I don't know why God don't answer prayer. The pure in heart shall see God. The pure in heart will have their prayers answered. You say, well, preacher Ronnie, I must not be very pure then. Then let the blood of Jesus cleanse your temple. Don't mope around and complain and gripe and say, well, why God, why God, why God? Why don't you say, who God, who God? God, I need to know who you are, and I'll tell you who God will say he is. I'm holy, be ye holy. That's who God is. And if you would just get your heart pure before a holy God, what can happen in your prayer room? Well, number one, I see here priority. He says, my house shall, didn't say hope might think, my house shall be called the house of prayer. Prayer is to be the priority of your life. And if it's not, no wonder you're so unhappy. No wonder you gripe and complain. No wonder you have a negative spirit. You've not come to the one who's the answer. Hello? You know what? When we don't pray, we simply say, God, I don't need you. I've got this figured out. And that's where most churches are today. Can I just tell it like it is? The smallest meeting of people in a church is a prayer meeting. Any church, not just this church. That's true in this church, but it's true in every church. Why is it that the smallest meeting is a prayer meeting? Because we think we know more than God. Oh, yeah. We don't need to go to God in prayer as a church. We don't need to go to God. Uh, but Jesus said, make my house a house of prayer. It should be the priority of our lives. You say, oh, preacher, you're just preaching. No, I'm not just preaching, folks. Prayer really does work. Amen. You want to see God work in your life, call upon me. He gives us his promise. In fact, right here, here's a great promise. Uh, let's go on down some. Look at John uh, 21, uh, 22 maybe? Let's see. Uh, yeah, 20, 22. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Is God's word a lie? Ye shall receive? Well, why haven't we received? And all things whatsoever thou shalt ask in prayer, there, there's the key, ask in prayer. But the key word there is believing, right? Believing, you can believe or receive, or you can doubt and do it out. I'm telling you something, folks, we need to spend more time in prayer. Prayer is the greatest need in my life. Prayer is the greatest need in your life. Billy Graham was asked, if you had to go back and do your ministry all over again, what would you do different? Are y'all listening? Billy Graham, you can find this. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, on, it's recorded. He said, I'd preach less and pray more. You know why he said that? The, that whole ministry was built on prayer. They never did a crusade that they didn't pray five years out before the crusade. You know why thousands of people walk those aisles to get saved? Billy Graham preached the simplest message you, you could preach. He just preached the simple gospel. But all those people got saved because they'd been prayed in. Oh, yeah, I was part of it. I, I, I was there. I, I was part of a five-year prayer meeting in Charlotte. And we were praying for souls. And guess what? So many people getting saved, uh, you, we needed more counselors. We, we didn't have enough people. I, I had to put counselors with, with uh, several people. It was supposed to be one-on-one -on -one counseling. Prayer was the priority of the Billy Graham Crusades, and prayer must be the priority for us. You ask the singer, well, uh, what is the house of God? Oh, it's a house of singing. You ask the Sunday school teacher, well, what is the purpose of the house of God? It's a place of teaching. You ask the preacher, well, preacher, what is the purpose of the house of God? Well, it's preaching. No, Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. You know why he said that? Because he knew without prayer, your preaching wouldn't be no good. He knew your teaching wouldn't be good. And even your singing, because you can't preach any better than you pray. You can't teach any better than you pray. And you can't even sing any better than you pray. If you come up here and you lead in music and you haven't prayed, don't look for God to bless that. Oh, you might try to sing your lungs out, and you might sing from your gut, and you'll give it all you got, and you're just trying your best to get that word out. You let God anoint your voice. You let, I tell you what, 
You've, you, you've been praying. You've been praying. I've never come to this pulpit without prayer. And folks, let me tell you something. Prayer is the priority of our lives. Every miracle was born in time with the Father in prayer. Every word he spoke, he got from heaven. He spoke only after he had been in prayer with his Father, Jesus said. He knew you couldn't do anything any better than pray. And then you need a place of prayer. You want, you want to have a, a place of prayer? Well, he said the house or the place of prayer... Jesus had a place of prayer. Oftentimes, you know, he would go up into the mountains and pray, or he would, uh, he would uh, get along in prayer. Uh, allow me to say that when you are uh, spending that quality time along with God, your prayer life is not only grow, going to grow, but you're going to grow a lot. Because I'm going to tell you, the, the, listen, are you listening? As you draw near to God, he draws nearer to you. That's what prayer is all about. Prayer is not about getting all that you want answered. He's not, you know, he's not an errand boy. He is God, and what he wants is a relationship. Amen. He wants your love and affection. He wants you to come to him and say, Father, I love you. I, I, I praise you. I thank you. I give you glory. And as you praise him and thank him and give him glory, guess what he does? He looks down in his wonderful, sweet, loving smile and his favor and says, I'm just going to bless his socks off. Because this, this person's serious about me. Not what they can get from me, they just want me. And that's what that place does. When you have a place of prayer, this is known as a place of prayer in the church. Is it not? The altar? What if you came to the altar and said, all right, God, I'm not going to turn a loose of the horns of the altar until, God, I hear from you. I need to hear from you. And, folks, prayer is a dialogue. It, it's not you telling God everything. You need to get down here and say, all right, God, I'm talking to you, but I'm also listening to you. Hello? Are you all with me on that? Because God is a speaking God, Amen. and he will speak to you. But you got to. You know what the problem is? We go to God and we tell him all we want. We get up and we walk out. <laughs> no. You know what? When you talk on the phone, don't you listen to what the other people... Do you do all the talking on the phone? That would be silly. That'd be talking to yourself. Why would you even call the person? Hello? But if you talk to God, it's a two-way conversation. You talk to him, he talks to you. That is the place. And somehow, I don't understand this clearly... But I've got a place, and it just, it's, it just happens supernaturally. When I get into that place, my heart's already been prepared to pray, because I know that's the place I go to meet God, okay? I mean, you have places you do certain things, and you go to the kitchen to prepare food. You sit at the table to eat. You've got places, right? You set a, place, a, a, a plate to eat out of. Why not have a place that you meet God? It could be a closet. It could be behind a chair somewhere. Find you a place to meet with God show up. I promise you, he'll show up. God loves it when his children take the time to seek him, to talk to him. Make my house a house of prayer. Much prayer is much power. Little prayer is little power, and no prayer is no power. Then that's our position. What was the position of the people in Jesus' day? He said, you've made it a den of thieves. You see, a humble heart is the correct position of prayer. Don't tell God what to do. Prayer is all about you seeking Him. If, if Jesus Christ was above everything else a man of prayer, then why is it that prayer has such a little part in our lives? I mean, Jesus made prayer a big deal. That way, He was in a prayer position. You know, I've heard people criticize, you know, people, sometimes they don't just, stu they don't study their Bible. You know, I've heard people say, well, you can't stand and pray. Well, Jesus stood and prayed. Well, you can't kneel and pray. Yeah, yeah, you can. You can't have your eyes open. One Sunday I opened my eyes in my prayer life, and someone said to a uh, preacher, you're not supposed to open your eyes. Well, I wondered what, how they knew my eyes were open. <laughs> but you know, I don't really care if this offends you folks. Amen. I often talk to God with my eyes open. Amen. If you're driving... That might be a big deal. <laughs> Sherry and I pray together all the time in the car, and she'll say, well, let me pray. I say, well, I can pray too. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, hey, he's not dead. Amen. I don't have to shut my eyes because, and by the way, the Bible does say you can pray with open eyes, okay? He's alive. Amen. I'm looking for him to do something in my life. Why shouldn't I be, you know, 
Looking for it. Yeah, I'm looking for it. Thank you, Ernie, for that. All right. But that's my position. I ought to be looking for God. To, hey, if I believed, why wouldn't I be looking? All right, God. I believe in you. All right, the third thing. We're going to talk about power now. Because we're going to talk about what God does. Our God's a powerful God, folks. And you may feel like you're weak. But I'm going to tell you something. Jesus, the Bible says, was a meek man. That's power under control. But he was not a weak man. No, he, 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 he showed his power right here. You know, there seems to be a debate today on what God can do. But I can tell you this, church, listen to me carefully. I'm trying to speak from my heart to your heart today. He can do a whole lot more than you think he can do. We've yet to see what our God can do. And he can do something great in your life today. How's it going to happen? Well, number one, I want to talk about healing power. You see it in verse 14? This is so interesting to me. This, was, this is the transforming power of God here. Notice, I just, I, I've never caught this before. It says that when he cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple, then it says in verse number 24, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Isn't it interesting that God says, get the mess out of here that's not of me so I can do my work? Hello? He cast out those with the wrong motive, with the impure heart. He moved them out of the way. He said, now you're going to see my power. One thing that we see happening here is that the religious people stepped aside and the people who really needed the Lord were allowed to come into the temple. They before were not allowed to come in. But Jesus made a way. Aren't you glad? Listen to me. Talking about prayer right quick. That he tore that veil in two so that we can all go into the Holy of Holies and pray. You don't have to go through a pope, priest, priest or preacher. Pastor, you have direct access to God. The Bible calls it a priesthood of believers. I want to talk about his healing power, though. I tell you, you, you you've yet to see what God can do. You, 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 I, I know God can heal. I, I, I've seen that happen right here in this church. God is a miracle-working God. I don't know why we don't talk more about his healing power. Are y'all listening to me? I want to tell you, 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 get the, you, you get people pure before God. You, you get people praying before God. The power of God will fall. You know what? This is the most serious thing I can talk about today. And yet, there are lost people. They need saving. There are people that need healing. And I'm telling you with all my heart today, if we'll get pure before God and we begin to pray over people, the power of God will fall. Amen. He promised that. That's what happened here. He got the church pure. He, he, he began to teach them, my house is a house of prayer, and he prays. And he heals people. And guess what? God has never changed. I said God has never changed. By the way, his word has never changed. We as a church have got in our mind, Satan has deceived us as a church, I believe, into thinking, well, we got to reach the world. We got to act like more of the world. No, we need to act more like Christ. That's what transformation is all about, becoming more like Christ. Here's God's power. We need to see that power in our church or we're going to have to die and go to heaven talking about the revivals of yesteryear, the Whitfield revivals, the Wesley revivals, the Moody revivals, the Welch revivals. Or we're going to have to die and go to heaven not seeing God do a powerful work today. Folks, I believe God wants to pour out his spirit today. I really believe that. And that can happen today in you, in your personal temple. Oh, you can be transformed today because he's a transforming God. There's power in prayer. There's power in purity. There's power in the Word of God. There's power in the Holy Spirit. There's power in God. There's power in Jesus' name. And there's still power in the blood. Amen. And if we'll just preach the blood. Billy Graham, I was watching him last night, and he was on an interview. You say, preacher, he's in heaven. Well, he was on an interview on TV. But they were asking him, what was the turning part of your ministry? He said, when I realized I just need to preach the cross and the blood. He said, I preached one night and nothing happened in the crusade. The next night I came back and I preached on the blood of Christ and thousands got saved. You know why? And this is what Billy Graham said. The power is not in the man, it's in the message. You may not like me, you may not like so-and-so, but you know what? The power is not in the man, it's in the message. 
the power of the gospel. The Bible says the word of God is the power of God unto salvation. And that's Holy Spirit power. Let me talk about that. Holy Spirit power. It says when the chief priests, I'm talking about the religious folks and the scribes, saw the wonderful things that he did. Now they, they noticed this. And Jesus talked about this often. Jesus said, I do these things by the power of God in me. God the Holy Spirit can do more in a church in five minutes than we can do in 50 years. What God can do in this place? Well, He can heal the sick. He can save the souls. He can change. By the way, you and I can't. Ronnie Stewart can't heal nobody. Ronnie Stewart can't save not even one soul. But the Holy Spirit of God, when He begins to work, He draws sinners to Himself. Oh, that healing touch of the Master's hand. That's all it takes, one touch. And the question is today, do you want the power of God in your life? The healing power, the Holy Ghost power. There's no limit to what God the Holy Spirit can do in the life of a church. And I will say this, and you know I've seen this, that there are churches that say, well, we're just a little church over here in the country, and, and we can't do but so much. Our, we're so limited. Well, folks, let me tell you something. There is no church that has a monopoly on God's power. God will work through anybody He wants to work through. Yeah, the nation of Israel, He called them out. A peculiar people, a chosen people. But God called you to be a peculiar people, a chosen people. And I don't know why, but God's called you. He saved you. And if His redeeming power saved you and made you pure, and you begin to exercise your privilege of prayer, you'll see the power of God work in your life. Amen. Healing power, Holy Ghost power. And yes, I got to tell you this, I like that word there, Hosanna. Hosanna's power. And the children crying in the temple, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. What does the word Hosanna mean? It means save us now. Are y'all following me? Save us now. God will save you today. Today is the day of salvation. Some of you are looking around like right now, I wonder what the Lord's going to do here today. I'll tell you what He wants to do. He wants to save that person who needs Him most. Jesus is more concerned about those who are lost than we are. He's more concerned about those who are sick than we are. Yeah. He cleansed the temple. He said, get all this junk out of here. We're going to, the day's going to be a healing day. The Holy Spirit was there for even the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things. I looked that word up, wonderful. It, in the Greek, it actually means remarkable. I'll tell you something. God will do remarkable things. Because he has Hosanna's power. He's got the power of God on him. The power to save. That's who this Jesus is. We need the power of God to fall fresh in our churches. When Jesus comes to church, the Holy Spirit comes with him. Can I get an amen? amen. You'll never separate them. For where the Spirit is, there's the Lord Jesus. Amen. By the way, nobody can walk this aisle today and get saved unless the Spirit of God's here. Right. It's not based, and I've accepted this many years, not based on my preaching. My preaching ain't got nothing to do with it. It's the Holy Spirit. I used to preach like this. Are y'all getting it? Are y'all getting it? I wanted everybody to get it. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, it's not your job for them to get it. That's my job. I'll help them get it. I'll teach them truth. You just deliver. I'm just a delivery boy. The Holy Spirit will take that and speak to your heart and transform your life. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible says no man can be saved unless the Spirit draws him. You want Hosanna's power to save you today? Then hear the call of God, the Holy Spirit saying, come. Why do you want to come? Because the Holy Spirit's working. It's not your flesh to come to God. Save us now is what these children were crying out. And then last, and I'm done, is praise. You see the fourth word here. We're talking about what happens when Jesus comes to church. And folks, when Jesus is here, you got something to praise about. God inhabits the praises of, of his people. For sure, this is something Satan would love to get in on. I don't know why Satan hates the people that praise God so much, except that he wants the glory. It's amazing, the warfare that happens. I came in this morning at 9 o'clock, and Jeff was sitting by there. He said, Preacher, this is something else. And I said, Brother, Satan is in the media. He's in the airwaves. He's going to do everything he can to upset God's people from praising him. God don't want us to praise him. I mean, Satan don't want us to praise God. But I'll tell you this, it pleases God when we praise him. Look what it says here in this scripture. 
This is amazing to me. Verse 15. The religious people, they were so displeased. He said, they were saying, Hosanna to the son of David, talking about the chief priests and the scribes in verse 15. The last part says, they were so displeased. And then they said, here's what these are saying. They're, they're giving you all the praise and the glory. Well, guess who deserves all the praise and glory? He does. There was a hindered praise here. They were so displeased. But the very thing that displeased them is the very thing that pleases God. I want to talk about hindered praise. Here we see hypocrites. That's what they were. They said they were religious, but you know you can be religious and religiously lost. Amen. Oh, they were church members. They'd been in the temple all their life. But they were hypocrites because they were against praise. Here were some newborn babies, some new Christians praising God, and some religious folks got all upset about it. The Bible says, touch not my anointed. It's a dangerous thing to touch the Lord's anointed. Don't you know that is what Jesus taught us to quote Scripture to the devil? And this is something that really aggravates the devil, but I'm going to do what Jesus did. I'm going to quote Scripture. Here's what he quoted, Psalm 8, 2. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings has thy ordained strength. That's in Psalm 8, 2. Because of thy enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. Vance Havner said that the new Christians would have to backslide before they could really fit into the church. You know why that is? Because here's these new Christians, and they're just so excited they got saved. They, they, they're just so excited that their life has been transformed. They've experienced something supernatural inside of them. No longer are, are they, they laid with the burden of sin on them. No longer are they in death. They're no longer in that grave. But just as sure as Jesus got up from that grave, he lifted you up out of that miry clay, and he set you upon a solid rock, and he established you. Going. I'm telling you something. That's the reason to praise Him. All praise is based upon redemption. And if we can't praise God for saving us, then we don't have nothing to praise Him for. Really. I mean, it, it, that's where praise starts. Who's hindering praise in your life? I'll tell you who. You say, well, the devil? Yeah. But sometimes you are. Why is it we can't come to God and say thank you? Why can't we praise Him? And we all do it differently. When I first came here, there was a man that walked out the door of his Sunday, and his glasses, I could see, were stained with tears. I believe he praised God during the service. Everybody praises God differently. But I think everybody who's truly saved will praise him. You're going to give God some kind of praise, somehow or another. So let's talk about that, hearing praise. Because this, this is what the chief priests and the scribes said unto him. Hearest thou what these say? Can you hear all this commotion, Jesus? There's no order in God's house. Should you not call these people to order? All praise, friend, comes from an overflow of your heart. It's, it's not something that you uh, have to work up. And that's something I have a problem with today. I, I really do. You say, well, preacher, you're old-fashioned. I really have a problem with the churches that have to work people up in a false sense of praise. Yeah, they, they, they get people all... You know, excited about a song, boom, 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 boom. And you know what they're excited about? The beat. And then they, they get excited about all the music. And then they got to put the fog machine on, and, and, and we're going to make it look like God is here. Now, let me tell you what I think about what the Bible says. God has a fog machine. Oh, yeah. The Bible says God's, God's glory filled the house of God so much that the minister could not see the minister because of the cloud of the presence of God. The cloud showed up over the children of Israel and led them by day, a pillar of fire by night. Oh, God, God has his own smoke machine. You don't have to make it happen. When God shows up in the place, you'll see the manifestation of his presence. Oh, yeah, you don't have to work people up in a false sense of praise. Are y'all listening today? Uh, if it's not from your heart, it's not real anyhow. Amen. It's got to be from an overflow. You've been worshiping God and praising Him Monday through Saturday. And Sunday is going to be Super Bowl Sunday. Yeah. Amen? Amen? I mean, Sunday. I mean, what if we would get excited about Jesus like we get excited about a, I mean, think about the Super Bowl. By the way, 
You remember the year that Tom Brady was accused of deflating the football? That whole, that whole Super Bowl was deflated. I mean, I didn't get anything out of it. I watched it. But all the hoopla, people get all excited. And millions and millions and millions of dollars are spent. And here we got a Savior worth praising. <laughs> and are y'all hearing what he's saying? Here's what the scribes and Pharisees were really saying. Can you not hear that they're giving you all the glory and honor and praise, and it only goes to God? Well, they sure know who Jesus was, did they? Because Jesus is God. God in flesh. And the commotion, all the excitement, and the priests and the scribes were saying, don't you hear what's happening here? You're supposed to be a teacher. Teach them right. And Jesus said, I have taught them right. They're giving me the glory because I'm the one doing the saving. And there's only one who gets any glory in God's house. That's Jesus Christ. I didn't die for nobody. You didn't die for anybody, but Jesus died for everybody. And that's the last thing I want to say to you today. There is a humble praise. And I say this with humility. It says, And Jesus said unto them, Yea, have you never read, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, Thou hast perfected praise. You see, the religious hypocrites would not praise him, but the humble children, the new Christians, they would praise him. You know why the priests and the scribes didn't praise him? And you know why they were upset at the young people praising God? Because they, they didn't know this Jesus. They didn't even recognize who he was. I mean, they, they heard his teaching, but they hadn't had a born-again experience. You know how I can know that? Because they're so angry that Jesus is getting glory. What makes you angry? Are you angry about something because it displeases you? Or are you angry about something because it displeases God? You see, what was displeasing to the scribes and Pharisees was that Jesus was getting the praise. It says it was the, the word here, they were displeased. But that's the very thing that pleases God. Church, look at me. I'm trying to say something to you. I think it's humility in a church when people begin to praise God. We recognize that we better not take any credit for nothing. It's not about us. The Bible says God resisted the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. His grace is worth praising. I said his grace is worth praising. And folks, I'm telling you something today. It's very important that I say to this to you. We must humble ourselves to praise God. Because in our flesh, which is pride, we won't praise Him. We don't want to give God glory. We want the glory. We want people's attention. We want people uh, to, to look at us and say, well, look who I am. But the Bible says that these people were displeased. The chief and the scribes saw the wonderful things, and it says in the last part of verse 15, and they were so displeased. What displeased them was pleasing to God. Let's take the word praise right quick. Y'all see it up there on the screen? P, it stands for pleasing God. R, it releases faith. Praise activates and it releases faith. A, it assures hope. Changes disappointments into God's appointments. I, it increases love. S, it serves joyfully. E, it endures eternally. Praise has lasting value. What we start here will last for eternity. Are y'all listening? Let's praise Him. I think it's a humble thing. I think it's something that you commit your life to and say, God, I'm going to give you the glory and the honor and praise out of my life. And it pleases God when we do it. We're fixing to sing a song. He knows your name. You know, not only He knows your name, He knows every hair on your head. <laughs> but He also knows whether what we do here today is in pleasing to Him or not. And we're here to praise Him. Can we praise Him right now? Because that's what pleases Him. What pleases God is our praise. He said, make my house a house of prayer. Look up here, church. I think one of the most profound thoughts, and I know you're going to think, well, your brain ain't very deep. But one of the most profound thoughts I've ever had is that God hears and answers prayer. 
Now that to me is a profound thought, that the holy righteous God longs to hear the prayers of His people and that He will hear and He will answer prayer. Now look up here, church, before you get ready to leave. You talking about praise in the house of God, you start seeing your prayers get answered. <laughs> You start seeing people getting saved. Let me tell you something. There's people in this church who've been prayed into the kingdom of God. Yeah, I know some people. I know some ladies who got together, and Jeff Hall's got this testimony. And they prayed old Jeff in, and Jeff is saved today because somebody prayed for Jeff. Somebody prayed for you. Oh, I love it. Love it, love it, love it. Our last prayer time here, church-wide prayer time, Amy had us praying for the lost. That's one of the greatest things we could do is pray. For, I, I don't know of anything we could do any greater than praise. Can we praise Him now? Let's all stand together. This altar in the church is known as a place to pray. I'm going to invite everyone here today to find a place. I think it's time that the church make prayer the priority. Look up here. Is there anything more important that we, we need to do? I said, is there anything more important that we need to do? I said, preacher, I've got to go to lunch. You want to see the power of God in your life? Call upon me, he said, and I will show you great and mighty things that you know not of. You want to know what God can do? Look up here, church. It's what prayer can do. What prayer can do. I'm going to ask you to bow your head before we sing this song. And if there's someone that don't know Jesus, I'm going to ask you to pray this simple prayer. I'm going to lead you in it, but it's got to be your prayer. If it's not coming from you, it's not real. But I'm just going to lead you in this prayer. Would you make it your prayer right now? If, you're, if you've never, no one has ever led you in a sinner's prayer, I want to have that privilege of leading you. Just say, dear God, and you just pray this prayer silently. Say, dear God, I believe in Jesus. I believe he died on that cross for all my sin. I believe he rose again that I might have life and have it everlasting. I know I've sinned and I ask you, Lord Jesus, to forgive me of all my sin, to come into my heart and save my soul. And from this day on, I surrender my life to Jesus Christ. Thank you for hearing my prayer, and I want to praise your holy name. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. As our heads still bowed, our eyes closed. I wonder if anyone just prayed that prayer. Would you slip up your hand real quick? Thank you. I see it. Thank you back there. God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Anyone else? Now that's the Holy Spirit at work here today. Someone else who prayed that prayer. Now I'm going to ask you to praise Him. Don't let nothing hinder your praise today. You say, Preacher Ronnie, how can I praise the Lord? By coming and making a public profession of your faith. By letting Jesus Christ be your Lord and Savior. And you said, if you confess me before man, I'll confess you before my Heavenly Father. Would you come? Holy Spirit, this is your invitation Thank you that many have already found their way at this place of prayer. You said, make your house a house of prayer. And we praise you, O God, for being the great God that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you come as we sing? He knows your name.